Galatians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verse 16 through verse 18 this morning. The title of the message is, Our Law and Guide in Warfare. Our Law, the Believer's Law, the Believer's Guide in the warfare, and this is going to be evidently speaking of our warfare in our flesh, with our flesh. But Paul says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, we have made this, this the apostle through this book has made it very abundantly clear that our justification, our sanctification, our redemption, and all our salvation was accomplished only by Jesus Christ and only received through faith in Jesus Christ. And not on any level by the law. Now, you, that's the sum of this book. Has it not been the sum? We've, we've been through this again and again. This is the sum of the book, that we are justified, sanctified, redeemed by the faith of Christ and not by the law. And any man who claims his salvation is in any part, Paul says, that man doesn't know Christ. Christ doesn't profit that man anything, whosoever he is. If you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you, what? Nothing. Nothing. And so then, he encourages believers to run the race. These, these, these people were hindered by this. They had, they had been drawn back by the law and said, you've been hindered in your race. Don't be hindered. Throw off every weight and the sin that easily besets you. Looking, this is how we run, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And by no means are we to return to the law for any help or any guidance, but what is the law, but what law is then the believer under? Now listen, we are believers, we are not antinomian, we are not lawless, we are children of liberty, but we have a law. We have a law. It's just not the law of Moses. We have a guide. It's just not the Ten Commandments. So what is it then? Every believer knows this. We need a law. We need one. We need a guide. As we are journeying through this life, we need one. How many times have you been often so com conflicted? You had no, you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do. This is often our estate as a believer in Christ. Most every day, I seem confused. I struggle. We all who believe in Christ have been justified. Isn't that right? We've been sanctified. We've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have been born again and given a new nature. Isn't that right? You that believe in Christ, you and I are spiritual beings. We have been born again of the Spirit of God, given a new nature. And Paul says this about your new nature. He says that this new man is created. Ephesians 4.24, this new man is created 
in righteousness and true holiness. Every believer in Christ, I want you to understand this, you are perfect before God. Perfect. You were made perfect by Jesus Christ and through faith, that perfection. God has imparted that perfection to you and me in the new nature. Our sins have been removed from us. We have, have our God has imparted, imputed our sins to His Son on Calvary's tree. It was there in His body that God exacted perfect justice and punished all the sins of His elect people. And what was the result? What was the finality of that death, of that offering? Jesus said this, It is finished. It's done. What was done? He purged our sins. Now what he says in Hebrews chapter 1, He, being the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself, listen, purged. Past tense, isn't it? Purged our sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In Hebrews 9, Paul said this, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made, made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, well, he's talking about his flesh. He came as a high priest in the flesh. Not like that tabernacle there. He tabernacled among us in his flesh. Neither by the blood of goats and calves but by His own blood, entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That was the finality of that transaction. Isn't that a glorious thought that all of our sins, all of our sins are now forever removed from us. They were forever put on, they were put on him and he has forever paid the just price for your sins, obtained eternal redemption for us by his one offering, his perfect offering. Now listen to this. So far has God removed those sins from you and me that they cannot be found by God. This is an astounding thing because I find them every second of every day. Don't you? Look in the mirror and what do you see? You see sin. What do you feel in your heart? You feel sin. What do you do in the flesh? You commit sin. And yet this is astounding that God cannot find them. Jeremiah 20, 50 and verse 20. In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. The sins of Judah, and it shall not be found. Now, how can you explain that? Well, God explains it. For, this is why they won't be found, and this is why there won't be none. For I will pardon them that I reserve. Because of the sovereign love and will of God through the death of His Son. He cannot find your sins and He will not impute to you sin because they're paid for. They're done. The transaction's done. God cannot demand twice payment for sin. Now, seeing God's Word concerning Christ's one offering, our justification, our sanctification, our redemption, seeing that He has called us and given us this new nature that cannot sin, we're going to see that in just a minute. This, you, you realize that? You, that new nature can't sin whatsoever. It has no sin. It cannot sin. If this is true, why do we need a law? Why do we need a guide? This is the reason. Because we still have the old flesh 
the old nature of sin that we were born with. This is the reason we all understand we need a law by which to live. Because of the old man of sin. When God gave us a new and holy nature without sin, He did nothing to improve the old man. This is what religion's all about, isn't it? Fixing the old man. That's what religion's about. They're all about fixing you. That's not true religion. True religion is a new you. A created you. That's what you need. A new heart. A new man. You don't need to fix up the old. God didn't do it. When He saved me, gave me a new nature, He did nothing to the old man except put him down. That's it. He put him down, but He did not eradicate him as yet. Now, surely, this is the greatest conflict and trouble that a believer faces in this life, is himself. The warfare that he engages in on a moment-by-moment basis with his own wicked, sinful, evil nature. This is the most troubling thing for a believer. We are men and women, then, of two natures. Two natures. Two distinct and separate natures residing in one man. In one man. These natures are called the Spirit. What Paul calls them in our text. He said, For the flesh... Lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. He is talking about two natures warring within our own flesh, our own body. And these two, Paul says, are completely opposed to one another. You can't find a more opposite thing than flesh and spirit. The new man and the old. They are as opposite as day and night. They are as opposite as light and darkness, as water and fire. They are opposite, and they cannot and will not ever mix together, though they reside in one body. Now, the mind of the religious legalist is that man's fall was not so bad that this nature was not so bad. This is why they call it a bruise. They don't call it death. They believe man has some inkling of goodness left in his nature, some ability within himself to appeal to God, some goodness that God sees and desires him to bring out of him. That's what religion... That's why they must continue under law because they... They think by law that they can draw out that goodness. They fail to see that there is no goodness in the natural man whatsoever. That when Adam sinned, all goodness and holiness completely left him. God tells us that our old nature that we inherited was not wounded, but dead. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And this is the experience of every believer in Christ, is it not? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Death, the spiritual death of man, shows us the inability of man to do anything pleasing to God. 
He is dead in his sins. He cannot please God by any means or effort of the flesh. Flesh, then, Paul says, because of this spiritual death, is naturally opposed to the law of God and to God Himself. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, Paul says this, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, And here's the evidence of it. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind is enmity. That's a a statement of fact, isn't it? This is not a, a speculation. This is a truth. Your carnal mind, my carnal mind, that God did not repair is still at enmity against God. Our carnal nature is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, ever, ever, ever. This is why that God didn't make salvation by the law. Not that the law was weak, but that you were weak through the flesh. That I was weak through the flesh. We could not honor that law. We would not. So then the flesh being unable and unwilling to obey the law of God, but rather despises God, hates God. Therefore, all the flesh can do is one thing. See, that is all man could do in his fallen nature is sin. He can do nothing else. Look, you put a needle in his arm and you throw him on the street. You put him in the whorehouse. Or you can put him on a, on a throne. You can put a robe on him. You can put nice garments on him. You can make him smell good. You can make him moral. Both are completely opposed to God. Both of them. By nature, we are completely opposed to God. The flesh can do nothing but sin. And listen... All You muster all the strength you can. You muster all the determination that the human flesh can muster. And you cannot ever do good. I don't care how determined you are. You know, I've read this before, that the, that the priests in, in, the, in the Middle Ages, they, in order to, to keep themselves from adultery, they would whip themselves. You know that? They'd take... They'd take whips, and they would actually beat their bodies. You know what that did? Nothing. Why? It was still in their mind. It was still in their heart. That didn't do anything for that sin. Matter of fact, look at them now. Most of them are pedophiles. The reason that salvation cannot come by the law is because the flesh is weak. The flesh cannot obey it. What does Paul say in Romans 3? He said, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all together. That is, you take all their righteousness and put them together, and they don't mount to one righteous deed. They are all together become unprofitable. So then, consider the absolute ruin of our nature. I'm not talking to those outside. I'm talking to us. This is the ruin of our nature. This is my ruin. This is your ruin. We all have our our lot in this. I want you to consider this. You take a man and you put him in the best environment possible. You give him all that he could ever desire All he could ever want. You could set the best preachers in front of him and preach the best messages of Christ and sovereign mercy and free grace and forgiveness of sins, eternal life and peace with God. You can do that for a million years. And if it was left up to him to do it, he'll never do it. 
if it's left up to His will or one act of the flesh, this is how ruined we are. If salvation were left up to us in any part, we'd never be saved. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Aren't you glad that God drew you? You would have never come. Who maketh thee to differ from another? What hast thou thou hast not received? Praise God, He has taught us that Christ obtained all the righteousness and Christ redeemed us from all our sin and by grace He's given us spiritual life whereby we now, by faith, embrace Him, receive Him. Listen, is there anything else you want to do but receive Him as a believer in Christ? Is there anything else you want to do but be found in Him? I only want to be found in Him. If I have all my hopes and dreams and wishes... To be found in Him is my only desire. Now that is not a desire of the flesh. That is a desire only of the new man. Faith is the evidence of the new birth. And this new creature, this new creation of God that lives inside every believer in Christ, and because there is no change in the flesh at our new birth, what does this mean? It means that the flesh is still prone to every sin. That we still sin against God. And yet the Spirit, the new man, cannot sin against God. And what is the result of this? Conflict, struggle, warfare. One nature always seeking to reign over the other nature. And what's the result? You cannot do what you would. The flesh would leave God, and He cannot. The Spirit would only be righteous, and yet what? He cannot. Go over to Romans 7. See, the experience of the apostle is the same experience of every believer in this warfare. Verse 18 of Romans 7. I want you to notice how Paul is talking about one person. He's talking about himself. But yet he's talking about two principles, two laws, two natures within himself, a conflict. He said, for I know that in me, what do you mean in me, Paul? That is, in my flesh, the old man dwelleth no good thing. For to will, <laughs> there's the new man, to will to do good is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I don't know how. I find not. For the good that I would not do, would I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. Now if I do it, I would not do that what I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I find a law, a principle, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God in the inward man, but there is another law warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now listen, you don't have any experience in that. You know why? You only got one nature. You don't know anything about that struggle. It's because you ain't no struggle. But John says of this new nature, he says this. If we say, John says uh, about our struggle, he said, if we say we have no sin, you go to John, this is in John chapter 1. He said, if we say we have no sin. You know there's a bunch of fools running around preaching that. 
that because they're saved, they ain't got no sin at all. They don't sin, and they'll tell you to your face. I just love to see them when they get cut off in traffic. See how quickly that uh, erodes. I know they have sin. John says, if you say you have no sin, because that's all you can do is say, uh, they, can't, they can't prove that, they can only say it. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So what do we do? We confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. And so this new nature that's in us, it cannot sin. The old nature can only sin, and therefore the struggle begins. And so then, in the work of the Holy Spirit, in the life of every believer, in this matter of sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit is never to improve the old man. That's what religion thinks about sanctification, isn't it? That you're trying to make the flesh holier by your obedience to law or whatever guide they have for you. That's how they think you're making the flesh better. But the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification has nothing to do with the old man, but everything to do with strengthening the new man. Which causing the new man to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And yes, as a result of that grace, the old man is further cast off. But the old man is not cast off by me trying to cast it off. The old man is cast off. The more I grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ through the work of the Spirit, that causes the flesh to be put down. Now tell me, is this not the bitter truth of your life journey? That we desire to be without sin, but confess our sin. We desire to be like Christ, but yet cannot see it. We delight in the law after the inward man, but when I would do good, evil is present with me. Sin is mixed with all I do. I like that hymn. He says, His faithful follower I would be. I would be. Not that I am, I would be. We would soar with eagle's wings to heaven, but are often dragged to the earth by the corpse of this flesh. Lord, I would clasp thy hands in mine and never murmur nor repine. Content with whatever lot I see. For tis my God that leadeth me. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver us from the body of this death? Now, you see why we need a law? You see why we need this? Because of this struggle. We need a law to guide us. A law by which we are to live. And seeing we are prone to sin and engaged in a warfare, what? then is the law of the believer. It most surely is not the law of Moses in any part. That is not the law of the believer. That will not help the believer in his struggle. The law can only stir up sin. But here's our rule. Here's our life. It is the rule of the Holy Spirit. By the rule of the Holy Spirit alone are we able to overcome the lusts of the flesh. Isn't that what you... Go back to your text. Look at it. I say then, walk in the Spirit and maybe you might perhaps overcome the flesh. 
If you would just live by the Ten Commandments, then you could overcome the flesh. That's not what it says. Walk in the Spirit. And what is the result of walking in the Spirit? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, is that not a wonderful guide, wonderful rule of law for us? Walk in the Spirit. Oh, what is this to walk in the Spirit? When I heard this, when I read this, the first thing, Enoch, came to mind. Isn't that the first time you hear somebody walking with God? Enoch. Genesis 5, I think, 22. He says, And Enoch walked with God. Now, what does that mean? There was no law to walk by. He didn't walk with God by obedience to the law. There wasn't no law. How did he walk with God? Paul tells us plainly how he walked with God in, in Hebrews 11. He walked by faith. To walk in the Spirit is to walk by faith in Jesus Christ. He said of Enoch, by faith Enoch was translated. He should not see death and it was not found because God translated him before his translation it was... He had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. It is only by faith in Christ that we can be pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ. So Paul declares in Romans 8, verses 4 through 1 through 4, that the victory over the body of death, that the only rule for us is to walk after the Spirit. He says... For there is therefore no, now no condemnation to those who walk uh, in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the Spirit. Well, what does that mean, Paul? For the law of the Spirit. <laughs> this is our law, isn't it? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do is weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. To walk after the Spirit. Friends, this flesh will never get better. I want you to understand that. It's never going to get better. This struggle will never get easier. In fact, the further, the longer we live, the more we know the struggle deepens. The divide deepens as we grow in grace, doesn't it? But I'm telling you this, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall subdue the lusts of the flesh. Now, what does that mean, subdue? Does that mean that your lust will go away? No. That doesn't stop the lust from... How can you stop something from coming into your mind? You just can't. That nature is constantly seething with corruption, constantly pouring it out. But what Paul is talking about is keeping these from fulfilling what's in there. How do we do that? By faith looking to Christ. If you are looking to Christ, you will not fulfill that lust. If you're seeing the cross and what sin cost, you will not commit that sin. I'm not saying that it won't be in your heart to do it. I'm not saying that it won't be in your mind to do it. But Paul says, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't do it. Isn't that what the new man wants? The new man wants not to commit these things. He cannot fully eradicate the old man, but in the warfare he desires to subdue him, to put him down at every instance, whatever the cost. But I'm telling you that no amount of determination will do it. That's what we think, and that's a natural mind to think. If I could just determine not to do it. David did that, didn't he? And what did he say? He was like a boiler in his bosom. He just welled up until it exploded. You try to suppress sin by your determination, and you won't do it. You suppress sin by looking to Christ, and you will. That's our law. What is it? Faith. Looking to Christ. 
If we are living according to the law of faith and looking to Christ, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So then, believer, the law is opposed to grace. And the flesh, is a, as a flesh, is opposed to the Spirit. Do you feel the warfare? Do you feel the struggle? The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you cannot do what you would. This old Adamic nature of sin still dwells in us, and the Lord told us this when He said, That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so then the Spirit who dwells in us says of our new nature that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that which is born of God cannot sin, and this is the reason for the struggle. And so then there is nothing in us but confusion, conflict, and strife. Our hearts are too armies at war. Isn't that what it says in Song of Solomon? She said this, I am black but comely. We are as a company of two armies. Two armies set in opposition to one another. I like what Phil Philpot said about the believer. He said he is a strange and mysterious creature. He cannot live without sinning, yet he cannot live in sin. He cannot live with, without prayer, yet for days he cannot pray. Continually finds religion a burden, yet he would not part with it for the world. Lust after sin as a delicious morsel, yet hates it with perfect hatred. Esteems Christ the chiefest among ten thousand, yet at times... He is tried with doubts as to whether he is a savior at all. Mysterious creature. A paradox. Brother Don wrote this, this song about, he called it a, a paradox I feel. Two armies war within my soul, both flesh and spirit seek control. Both grace and sin resolve to reign this daily war within maintain. Grace bids me seek the Lord in prayer, but sin would drive me to despair. Sin drags me downward to the earth while grace lifts me, lifts my heavenly birth. The Spirit truly loves the Lord, His house, His people, His word. But still my heart with sin is tried, my flesh will never step aside. Oh, what a paradox I feel. A heart of flesh, a heart of steel. In love with sin, with sin at war, myself I love, myself abhor. Grace fills my soul with heavenly joys, but sin my happiness annoys. This sin resolved to hold me fast. Oh, but here's hope. Grace shall prevail or sin at last. <laughs> so what then is, the, is this hope for the believer? It is to walk by faith. To walk by faith. To walk in the law of love for Christ, which is manifested by our love and service to one another. And even though we walk by faith and love, we still know the lust of the flesh will continually burn within us. But we will walk by faith and love to Christ. We will not fulfill the desires of this flesh. There's your law. There's your guide. Do you not desire to be free from sin as best that you can? You bet. So what is our guide? It is to walk in the Spirit. That's our law. And Paul said this, if you be led of the Spirit, verse 18. Look at this one last thing, verse 18. If you be led of the Spirit, you are not under 
the law. Notice that. He said, if you be led by the Spirit, you won't do these things. Now, what he said? No. He said, no, if you be led by the Spirit, here's the evidence, you are not under the law. You won't walk by the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're going to walk by the Spirit. You're not going to... The Spirit and the law are opposed. They're contrary. They're separate. You're either walking this way or that way. You're not walking both. And so as a believer in Christ, our rule, our law is faith in Christ. And this is our hope of ever overcoming this flesh, of ever alleviating ourselves of this sin nature. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is this. You are more than conquerors through Him who loved you. You know that? You are more than con- conquerors. Let me ask you, you feel that? You feel more than conquerors. No. I feel defeated. I feel so often perplexed and cast down because of this warfare. I, I get tired. I'm weak. My only strength and rule is to walk in the Spirit, to trust Christ. Listen, if you're doing that, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, listen, you're not walking in the Spirit. That's just simple, isn't it? You're not looking to Christ if we are fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Matter of fact, usually we're just giving an occasion, aren't we? We're using our liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't do that. May God keep us from that. May He hold our hands all the way through this journey. I walk with Him. I want to walk with Him. I can't really hold His hand now, but I can by faith. I can't embrace Him by love physically, but I can spiritually. Why? God's given us these things in the new nature. May God give us strength to use them for His glory. Pray God do this.